Welcome to the Live Like Eden podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay, and I'm so excited you're here listening. We discuss all things transformation, shifts in consciousness, nature and foods that heal, the inner workings of the mind, and how to clean up and clear out your space. All of these topics and so many more will help guide us back to our true nature. A really good friend of mine recently asked me what I thought about the term spiritual bypassing. And my first instinct was, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I'm not somebody who is up to date on all the terminologies. I definitely rely on my friends sometimes to give me these terms in the spiritual world. However, after she described to me what it was, I immediately thought, oh yeah, of course. I know exactly what you're talking about. And this is a great topic of conversation because it's so common. I think many of us can relate to what spiritual bypassing is. So let's get right into it today and talk about this term spiritual bypassing. Let's first look at what it is, where it came from, and then we'll talk about how spiritual bypassing can actually lead to escaping and avoiding real issues in your life. Then let's look at, is there a gap between spiritual practices and actually applying those practices to your everyday practical life? This is a huge interest of mine personally, because I'm always thinking about how can you bridge this gap that there seems to be this wanting to sort of detach and feel this limitless feeling, but then you have to do life here. There's really no way around it unless you just check out, which is always an option, right? Most of us, if you're on some sort of a spiritual journey or you're really trying to seek that connection within you, this is going to come up in your life. How do I still maintain this practice, but actually use it in my life every day as we encounter all these conflicts that happen regardless. Then we're going to look at spiritual idealism, the ideas we have about what spirituality and being spiritual looks like. This, I think, is a huge issue. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit more and realize that does it need to be that way. And then lastly, let's look at how can you avoid spiritual bypassing in your own life? What can you do to sort of stop running if you find that that's what you're doing. First off today, let's talk about what this term means, spiritual bypassing. I'm really kind of starting to like this term. <laughs> the term was coined in the 1980s by a man named John Wellwood. Maybe you've heard of him. He was an existential psychologist by trade and also an author and teacher and also practicing Buddhist. He wrote several books, you can check them out. I can link all this in the show notes for you. But he noticed in the Buddhist community, when you're in a community of people that are learning to detach from the world around them, from everything around them, and really find that inner connection inside, he was noticing that just because people were doing this on a regular basis didn't always equate to them solving their real life problems. In fact, he noticed that often it was much worse. They couldn't even figure out how to deal with real life, the issues that are constantly presenting themselves to us. He did a lot of writing about it, a lot of talking about it, and he basically explained spiritual bypassing as the tendency to use spiritual practices and ideas as a means of avoiding deeper emotional and psychological issues. Simple, right? So you're saying, I'm going to implement my prayer time or my meditation time or whatever other practices that you're using in your life, I'm going to do that as opposed to looking at some trauma that continues to come up for me. In a way, it's like saying, well, I'm going to focus on finding a deep love and connection within myself. There's nothing wrong in doing that at all. But if it's not helping you solve some problems that keep appearing in your life, then he termed this as spiritual bypassing, that you're using spirituality to avoid your real life while you're here in the world. So the question to ask ourselves and ask yourself as you're listening is, do you do this? Do you ever find in your life where you are avoiding a very big issue or some drama that keeps blowing up in your face? And you'll say, well, I'm not going to deal with that right now. I need to go meditate or I need to just get away, or I'm going to go read passages out of a certain spiritual text that I love. This is quite common in the realm of spirituality, because in a lot of spiritual teachings, there's this idea that the world's an illusion, that this isn't real. Of course, in miracle students would fall into this too, and it can be a serious trap. 
because what you can get yourself into is saying, well, if this world isn't real, and if it really doesn't mean anything, or it's all illusory, it's only happening in my mind, what are we doing? Then I don't really care. I'm not going to deal with my marriage trouble, or I'm not going to deal with this problem I have at work because it's not really real. You can actually see where the ego is very clever and will slip in there. It's so good at that. And it will convince you that you don't need to deal with anything. When in fact, dealing with reality in many ways is bringing you to a deeper spiritual connection when you're actually looking, actually seeing what's right in front of your face. But it's really easy to want to bolt. We want to run away from our issues. And so John Wellwood did a really great job of devoting a lot of his life to discussing this very thing. And he really was trying to say, hey, only focusing on spiritual practice can actually be detrimental to your life in the world. Is there an extreme part where trying to awaken, because essentially somebody who's on a spiritual path and is working to connect with the divine or the cosmic consciousness or complete self-realization, all these terms that you hear, they're working so hard to do that. But is that awakening premature if you're not really looking at the things that are causing you so much angst and anxiety and difficulty in your actual life? You could put a lot of emphasis on trying to awaken, awaken from the dream, really trying so hard that it's almost like the ego gets so involved there that it doesn't see what it actually needs, like what's actually in front of your face, that everything right in front of you can be a great teacher for you. It doesn't have to be you in a long flowing gown with your candles and your crystals sitting in your closet, you know? Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying, if you're using it as a means to escape reality, that's really what we're trying to do is escape this world all the time, right? That's why there's so many distractions all the time. There's so many vices we all use to get out of whatever's happening in our life. This is very normal. When we're talking about in the realm of spirituality and spiritual awakening, this is something that can happen. And it's important for you if this is a topic of interest to you in your life, you look and see, am I doing this anywhere? Are there places where I am doing this? And I will share with you in a little bit where I was doing this in my life. So now that we talked a little bit about what spiritual bypassing means, just on a very basic level, I want to throw in some other pretty popular techniques and things that people do today that could also be considered bypassing situations. It may not be spiritual bypassing, but it is bypassing. Although these things can be helpful, because I think everything that you're trying to do to work on yourself can have some benefit. It's when it becomes extreme, just like anything in the world, when anything becomes too extreme, it can become a problem. So the things that I see, and you can see these in your life, you can also see probably many more than this, but the things that are popular would be positive thinking. Positive thinking can be great to get yourself out of a really down place, to get yourself uplifted again. But when you're using it constantly, well, I'm not going to look at that negative thing over there because I'm only thinking positive. And if I don't stay in that realm, the negative things will happen. So I won't look at it. You can see the extremes. And there are people like this. They refuse to discuss or look at anything that's detrimental or difficult or conflicting in their life. Instead, we're going to talk about let's be more positive and that'll fix everything. Now, it definitely can be helpful. If you're constantly throwing your thought system into a downward spiral, yes, shifting your thinking out of that can help tremendously. But when it's abusive, right, becomes like an obsessive thing for the ego in the positive realm, it's also an issue. So even on the opposite side of negativity, right, you can see how it works on both sides. When you're somebody who's like, well, I'm only thinking positive because you actually believe that nothing negative will happen to you if you only think positive. It's almost like saying that you're going to transcend this world like meditation. You're going to use positive thinking to transcend anything negative ever happening when we're living in the world of duality. <laughs> it's kind of nonsense. There's always going to be things that happen that you don't like all the time. So you can see this in that realm. You can also see it in like positive affirmations, the same kind of thing. If you take them to that extreme level, are you just using that to deny looking at the argument that you're repeatedly having with a good friend? If I just say this affirmation, I'm going to get my business off the ground. 
Meanwhile, I've done absolutely nothing to get the business moving, <laughs> you know? So there's like this mental construct that we live with. And then there's this practical doing of anything in the world. You can also see bypassing in people that are passive aggressive, whether they're conscious of this behavior or not, whether they're purposely ignoring you because they're upset with you or they're trying to teach you a lesson or they really don't know what to say, but they're purposely not speaking to you. This can also be seen as bypassing. You're not willing to discuss or work on it. So therefore I'm just going to ignore it or act like it's not happening. What about in religion, you need to attend a church every Sunday to be a good practicing Christian or a good practicing Catholic or whatever religion you follow. Attending church is like the checklist. I did good this week. I'm going to get into the kingdom, right? I'm going to go through the pearly gates because I just sat and attended church. Are you really looking at your life outside of Sunday morning? I did my thing in church, but now I'm going to go back this week. It's going to be a total mess all week long. How about rituals? Any kind of ritual, whether you're practicing rituals in a guru setting, a master or gods, anything like this. You know, I was in Thailand many years ago. I found it really interesting that they leave offerings for Buddha, the statues everywhere. So everywhere you go, there's just like food and drink. And I was always thinking, well, who's going to drink that? I mean, it would just be piles of gifts sitting for the Buddha. It was very interesting. So that's a form of ritual. This is the kind of thing you can apply it to your life all the time. You can see where the ego will come in and create distractions so that we don't actually deal with reality. Reality in the term of being right here, right now, where we think we are. And then one last one that comes to mind is just simply denying your own personal responsibility in anything you're doing that you might find yourself or other people that you're around that have a tendency to not take responsibility for their actions and then flip the scenario onto you. So immediately it's like a manipulation and now you're the problem. This concept of denying your own personal responsibility in anything. And that's classic ego feels threatened. I'm going to project onto someone else. All of these things I've just listed when they're taken to these extreme levels, Keep in mind, I'm talking about using them in an extreme way, not just for the benefit of your life now, but when you're taking them to this very elevated level, like positive thinking, affirmations, passive aggressive behavior, ritual, denying personal responsibility, all this is doing is you're redirecting your focus from actually dealing with what's happening and you're putting your focus on this new thing. It's just like a pattern in life or if you have a habit. Let's say you have a habit of drinking way too much coffee and now you feel crazy by two o'clock in the afternoon, but you can't stop. Every morning you get up and you just keep drinking the coffee and you're jittery until you redirect your focus, you know, you can't get out of it. So this is no different. It's like, if I wake up and I have an argument with my spouse, I'm going to redirect my attention right now and I'm going to go running <laughs> you know, so that I don't have to think about it. I can just blow it off. And sometimes that can be very beneficial for both people because you're not going to blow up. You're going to take a minute and relax. But if you never come back and address the issue, these issues continue to build. What John Wellwood was getting at with spiritual bypassing was no different. He was just applying it to becoming a more spiritually connected being. But that in doing that, you're redirecting your attention on your spiritual practice and not dealing with the current situations that may be bothering you in your life. I really love this idea because in a sense, you could look at the entire world is doing this all the time. How is it any different? We're all focused on our survival for one. So that's the distraction. And then having to deal with anything else that's conflicting gets put on the back burner. It just does. So this is a very normal thing that most of us do at some point in our life until we recognize that that's what's going on here until we really see it, and then we can sort of start shifting how we deal with it. So escaping and avoiding situations is something that all of us do at some point. We do it all the time. In my own personal life, when I was in the darkest of the dark of my own awakening, I didn't feel like I was going to be able to live in the normal world, or at least in the normal sense that we think of it, going out, living, doing the things you need to do. I didn't feel like my life was headed in that direction anymore. 
I was experiencing so much energy in the body that I just didn't want to deal with it. There's that key word. I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't even want to learn how to deal with it. What I really wanted to do, and keep in mind, I was married with four small children at the time. I really thought the best thing for me would be to just go into the woods and stay in a small cabin away from everybody. That's what I really was yearning for inside of me, that I just needed to get away from everything. And for many years, I thought about this and I thought that might be where I was headed. If I was going to continue to be unable to do the world like my husband knew me to be, like my kids probably wanted their mom to be, I didn't know that I was gonna be able to do that. So this idea of me running, there it is, I'm gonna go and escape and isolate. And I was already isolating in my own house. So I was thinking about taking it even further, like really disconnecting, like maybe I'm not the best thing for the family. All of these things kind of enter your head if you're going through something very difficult. I'm sure many of you have been in this situation in your life. It may have nothing to do with awakening, but something in your life where you just thought, you know what, I just need to get out of Dodge. <laughs> and I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna deal. And I thought that by doing this, I would have an epiphany of sorts, that something would just click when I was on my own, that something would just click. But I never did that. I never actually left. I stayed right there with my kids every day. I stayed there with my husband every day. And I lived the life that had been given to me at this time. What I didn't realize as it was happening, that it's exactly what I needed. I needed to actually look at what I was experiencing. What was I really feeling about this whole awakening process. I was mad. I was angry that this was happening. And so allowing these feelings to come up, because I think a tendency for most of us is to not feel dead in the feeling. Don't allow yourself to express anything, whether it's that we've been taught that since we've been young, or it's just a natural, innate feeling that we all share. This is what I needed. I needed to look look at what's happening express how you feel acknowledge it's okay that you feel horrible about this whole thing and you don't want it you really didn't want this but if i wanted it to work i was going to have to look and then i was going to have to learn i wanted to learn how i was going to integrate this new experience back into a world that i already knew but it felt completely new it felt completely different it's like learning to do something all over again, yet you already know how to do it. It's a very strange feeling. But what this was teaching me was that I didn't need to spiritually bypass and go sit on a mountaintop or sit in the woods, that I actually needed to get into my humanness, look at what was going on and get real. That's what it was showing me. And in doing this is where I would find that deeper connection that I would actually feel like I was working with this greater essence that I was feeling all the time instead of running away from it. This is the gap that I experienced. I was having this expansive feeling all the time, but I couldn't make any sense of it. And I wanted to just go sit with it, which I did a lot on my own anyway in the house. It wasn't like I needed to go anywhere to do that. But there was this gap missing of how to pull these together how to have this experience where you no longer feel like a body. You're still in the body, but you just don't relate to it like you used to. Your senses are now very heightened. Everything is connected. You feel like you're not separated from anything else. And now you're going to have to integrate this into practical daily life. And that's where we're going now. Is there a gap in learning spiritual practices and implementing them into your own life? To me, that seems to be where a lot of spirituality is lacking today, that it's fun to go listen to people speak. It's great to read books. It's great to do all of these things. I have done them all. But where the work comes, eventually you come to a point where there's a bridge between the two. And then you realize that I can do both. I think that's what John Wellwood was trying to get at with his term spiritual bypassing, that this is a tendency that I'm noticing in this community of Buddhists that I'm with, and there must be another way to integrate all of this together. And that's what I learned in my own experience was I could sit around forever wishing something would get better. I could sit and try to have some positive thoughts about this energy that I was feeling. Did that actually change anything about the physical experience of it? No, it did not. 
it was still there. So I knew there was more work to be done. It was like, now the work begins. It's the same thing if you are a meditator, you're somebody who uses meditation because it helps you calm down, you feel good after you do it. You're doing it for your own mental state, maybe even for your physical health, you're lowering your blood pressure, you know? I mean, the world makes everybody crazy. So any practice that you can do to help you stay calmer is beneficial. Meditation is amazing. But again, are you using the meditation to escape some issues that are in your life? Or is the meditation helping you? And it might, for some people, you may reach a point with your meditation where you are now bringing it, we're crossing the bridge and bringing that peace into your daily life, which would be the whole point of meditation at all. So the question really becomes, given where you are in your life, do you need to focus on the issues that are continuing to come up? Do you need to go to therapy? Do you need a psychologist? Do you need a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist, whatever, to help you process through these experiences that you may have had or continue to have? And at the same time, implement your spiritual practice so that you are bridging the gap that seems to be missing between the two. A Course in Miracles is so great at this very thing. On the one hand, if you're a student of the Course and you read that the world is an illusion and you run with that and only want to experience bliss and ecstasy and nirvana, and one of the great teachers I like listening to, Kenneth Wapnick, he used to call them bliss ninnies. I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> Because if you're only focusing on that element, you're not really getting at the aim of the course, which is trying to get you to actually look and see what's going on in your life. It's trying to get you to look and see what's going on in your mind, in your psyche, in the ego thought system. It's not asking you to do anything special. There are no special practices, prayers, meditations, anything like that in A Course in Miracles. In fact, it's not telling you to join a group, bow down to a guru, dress up in strange clothes on the weekend. It's not telling you to do any of that. It's very personal to you and it's addressing you where you are. Keep in mind that the scribe of A Course in Miracles, Helen Shuckman, was a professor of psychology from Columbia University. She was a psychologist. She was a brilliant psychologist. She received this information spiritually and it seems that the Course's aim is bridging this gap between having a practice and actually doing it in your life. Because when you turn your focus into taking what you're learning in your practice, and let's say you have a, a spiritual practice, whatever realm you're in, whatever you like to do, if you become very aware during that practice and take that same awareness back into your life, so now you're sort of living it all the time, it changes everything. Because now you're dedicated in a new way. It's like before when you're dedicated to setting aside your practice for a half an hour, an hour, two hours, however long you take, and that's it. Then the door is closed the rest of the day or the rest of the week. But when you shift your focus and say, ah, I see this. I see that I'm not really implementing this peace and calm that I experienced during my meditation, but I want to. I mean, isn't that the point? Don't we want to take this and move it into our experience with other people? into our relationships with other people? A Course in Miracles uses relationships as the number one form of teaching. And they're the hardest thing, aren't they? How many of you have relationships that pose a serious challenge? I never knew what it meant to be challenged so deeply until I had four kids. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, you talk about really making you look at yourself. They've been excellent teachers. To this day, I'm like, they are the best teachers I've ever had. That and my husband. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you out there can say the same thing about any relationship that you've had, whether it's personal, professional, it doesn't matter. Any relationship is there for you to learn. Bridging the gap between spirituality and the day-to-day -day life is exactly what spiritual bypassing is avoiding. By only solely focusing on trying to wake up. It's a denial of what is really going on, is it not? It's sort of a denial of where you actually think you are because we are where we are. As much as we may not like where we are, we are where we are. And as much as I didn't like where my life was at the time, until I said, 
this is the reality. This is where I'm at with it. And it had to get really dark and really, really down there in the hole. I like to say, when I go there, I go there in a big way. (laughs) Apparently that's what I needed. But it's also given me such incredible insight into how the psyche works. And for that, it's an amazing thing. And it showed me that I had to integrate. There was this whole nother step a completely new layer that I needed to experience. And to this day, I'm still integrating continually all the time. When I find myself wanting to bypass or not deal with something, I know exactly what I'm doing. And then I say, I'll get around to it. I will, I'm gonna do it, <laughs> you know? But that's part of being human. We're not perfect beings. And that leads me into the next topic, which is spiritual idealism. What does it mean to be a spiritual being. There are so many ideas floating around out there and people have in their minds about enlightenment, that if somebody is enlightened, they're going to look a certain way? I don't know, what is it? What do you think? Have you been around people that are expecting to see a blazing fire behind somebody who's got insight or (laughs) they're not gonna have any issues in the world? They're gonna transcend duality but still be here. And so they won't have any money troubles, won't have any relationship issues, won't have any trouble finding work. (laughs) What is it? I think there's some very misleading ideas about what it means to have an awakening or get in touch with something deeper, that suddenly you're not gonna be human anymore, that suddenly you're now going to be in a state of complete love and ecstasy constantly. Now, maybe I am very far from all that. I just don't relate to that at all. Maybe you do, and that's awesome. But I'm looking more at it like, but we're still human. Even if you've had these insights or aha or moments of complete divinity within you, you know, whatever it is for you, the fact that we're still human tells me that there's a huge part of our learning that's done experiencing the human realm. You can see this in spiritual groups, religious groups, cults. I've done a show on that. You can see how easy it is to put people up on a spiritual pedestal or that there's some sort of spiritual hierarchy. And to me, that's when the ego slips in. If you're doing this in your life where you have an idea in your mind of what a spiritual being looks like or what somebody who feels complete oneness should be like, notice that it's all should be. There's all these images in your mind of what you think it's going to be like. Are those really attainable? Are they even real? Or is that just the mind running wild? Is that the ego trying to distract from actually getting you to go inside yourself and be real with your life, your actual life? Even if you're meditating and you're somebody who's had just an amazing, blissful, expansive, unlimiting experience, these are great experiences to have. But does that mean that when you come back into your normal life, you're just going to float around and not experience what everyone else is? That somehow you're going to dodge all the dramas and conflicts that are always happening? Now, maybe if you choose to never interact with anybody, that could be true which is why we want to go and leave, right? Isolate into that cabin in the woods or that straw hut on the beach. Oh, doesn't that sound nice right now? I don't know about any of you, but I am in need of sunshine and a beach would be nice, but just temporarily, not forever. (laughs) When you come back from that meditation, after you've had this expansive feeling and you walk through the world again, you'll realize very quickly that you're back in your human experience. Somebody's gonna say something to you, somebody's gonna offend you, or there's gonna be chaos wherever you are. Your family might get into an argument. You might find your significant other is arguing, you're arguing back, your kids are in an uproar, and it's constant. That is just life. Thinking that there's some sort of perfect spiritual ideal to live up to is just a trick of the mind. And the real learning is bringing your experience with you in your life, applying it, actually applying it to the practical living. This is something that I focus on all the time. 
because it's looking at your life. It's looking at where you are, which is where we're going next, which is how can we avoid spiritual bypassing? How can you avoid it in your own life? If you notice that you're doing it or you have a tendency to do it sometimes, or maybe you're doing it all the time, how can you avoid it? The first thing that comes to my mind is get real with yourself. It's time to drop all those images and ideals that you have in your mind about what you should be like and look at what you are like. Meet yourself where you are. And you're only going to do this when you're really ready to look at it. When you're not ready, you'll deflect, you'll spiritually bypass, you'll distract, you'll redirect your focus somewhere else for a while. But when you really go inward and look at what you are currently doing, you have a reintroduction to yourself. It's like you're getting to know yourself for the first time. You may have been in complete denial that you're doing any of this. And all of a sudden, it's like shake hands with you. Notice where you've been living in a place, a vision you have of what you think you're going to be like in the future. Do you do that? Do you say, well, in five years from now, I'm going to be like this, or next week, I'm going to be like this, or when I lose 20 pounds, I'll look like this. When I get that new job, my life's going to look like this. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with imagining and manifesting things in your life. But it's again, when you're taking it to the extreme where it's constant, where you're never looking at you where you are right now, then you will have a difficult time finding that deeper essence because you can only find it right now. You can't find it out there in the future that doesn't exist yet. You can only meet yourself and that larger spiritual essence right now. So the first thing to think about is just where are you? Where are you at with this whole thing? And it's okay to just get your feet on the ground, get real, get comfortable in your skin, be okay with where you are, because it's your biggest learning tool that you have wherever you are in a relationship. Again, biggest learning tools that we have. Other people often show us what's going on in ourselves or things that we don't like about other people are sometimes the very things that we are doing. And sometimes there's relationships where you can't do anything. You're at an impasse. And then you have to decide, is this a time I surrender and let go of all of it? Do I just ask for guidance and see where this goes? Do I leave the situation? All these things come up. There's all sorts of learning involved with relationships, but they're amazing teachers. I would argue that relationships are even better teachers than sitting in meditation for hours. Because when you're actually pushed into a situation, it's pulling all of these elements and aspects and feelings, emotions and behaviors out of you, is it not? Have you ever been in a situation where something just royally ticked you off? And all of a sudden you're flooding all of this crap out of you, just coming out. It's like, where did that come from? But it's important that you acknowledge it. Yeah, that's how I feel about it right now. I acknowledge that. And that's why A Course in Miracles is so great. It's not asking you to deny those things in your life. What it is asking you to do is look at the teacher that you're choosing when you're doing it. That's it. If you can shift to say, I'm siding with my ego, or now I'm choosing to side with spirit, even in hindsight, you can look at it, something that happened yesterday and say, oh, look at that. Look what I totally did there. I just ran wild. <laughs> I went for it. And next time I'm in that situation with someone, I'm going to work on being present, being right here, right now in my humanness and choosing another way to see. And you can do this every single day of your life so that you're not spiritually bypassing. You're now actually staying present in the moment, connected, and working on the conflicts that arise in your life because they will always arise here. That's life and it's okay. For many people that have these spiritual ideals that somehow all of a sudden we're gonna be living in some incredible bliss reality. Again, where is your focus? Are you looking at what's really going on or are you just in your head thinking about what should be here? But this is what's here. And you can do it however you wish to do it. And that's the beauty of it. You can do this life however you want to do it. But if you're somebody who is looking for that deeper connection, you're really looking at your life, you're really wanting 
to figure things out, then this concept of spiritual bypassing may resonate with you. It may also bring to your attention when you're using it to avoid something that you may actually need to look at. Thank you to my dear friend, Julie, who brought this concept to my attention. It is so common. I know we all do this on some level, and it's nice to recognize when you're doing it and then how you can get out of it. Get real, look at where you are, make it as simple as possible. It doesn't need to be complicated. I hope you enjoyed the topic today, and I hope that you can use it in your own life because that's the whole point of the show is to gain insights into how you can apply these things in your own life, wherever you are. That'll wrap up today's show. I invite you all to check out my website at livelikeeden.com. You can sign up for a weekly email reminder when my new podcast and blog comes out, which is every Wednesday. If you are somebody who's really struggling and having trouble during awakening and you need some assistance, please sign up for a free consult. I would absolutely love to work with you. If you're enjoying the show, I ask that you share it with others. Until next time, thank you so much for listening.